Hey family, I am so excited to share with you the recording from our first ever live episode that we did. We did this last week. We brought on some old friends, some new friends. Meredith and Bridget came back on the podcast to join us for this event. And we were joined by brand new friends on the podcast, Darren Calhoun and Sarah Abbey. Oh, these, these four individuals are amazing and they did a great job finishing out this series that we've done these, the last two episodes and this episode as well. And this recording from this event was so good. We actually went on for two hours. So what you're about to hear is just part one. I want to thank everyone who was there. Your engagement, your questions were awesome. It was such, such a great event. We want to thank you all for joining that and we want to thank you to our four guests who took their time out of their busy schedules to join us for this episode so not going to talk any longer let's go ahead and listen to part one hello everyone um my name is meredith and um thanks for joining Um, Today, I have joining me uh, Bridget, Sarah, and Darren, and if you can all just give us just a brief history of uh, why you're here, just a brief uh, spiel about why you're here. Bridget, we'll start with you. Um, So, hey everyone, I am here because this is a conversation that is uh, uh, super important to me, Um, just speaking at the intersection of race gender and sexuality. Um, That is an intersection that I live at every day and um, something that I have spent a lot of time navigating um, throughout my life. And so um, specifically, especially in um, Christian spaces, I feel like um, this conversation is particularly important Um, thinking about how these things all converge together. Um, So I'm excited to be here, excited to talk about this. Thank you, Bridget. Sarah? Hello, everyone. I am really excited to be in this conversation. I have just really enjoyed, and I think my walk with God has been enriched as I have thought more about the intersections of race and my sexuality and gender and kind of the ways all of those things Um, play together. And I think the more that I learn about them, the deeper I know myself and know God. So I'm really excited. And Darren. Hey, everybody. Uh, Good to be here. Um, Always a pleasure to have conversation with these wonderful folks who are here. Um, For me, when it comes to the conversations about race, gender, sexuality, and faith, um, again, the same thing where we, we live at these intersections where we're often asked to choose between different parts of ourselves. Um, and the more intersections we live at, the more uh, stress and tension there can be. And I don't think it has to be that way. And so for me, I really enjoy having conversations about these things, um, helping people to figure out what their first or next steps might be, and hopefully making the world a better place for everybody in it in the process. So glad to be here. Let's talk. Awesome. Thank you. So let's go and um, let me ask some questions that we got from some of our audience. The first question is, um, <clears throat> within the conversation, church, within the church, oh, that's an awkward question. Let me go to another question. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> what is the role of other racial ethnicities in the race conversation being had? Um, i.e. Latino, Native American, Asian, where do we fit into this conversation? Let's begin with Darren. Sure. Um, you know, just to, just to give us some context, right? I think, I think we have to kind of define what we're talking about. Um, because anytime we talk about race, we typically have some assumptions that we're making. Um, we, we tend to blur race and ethnicity into the same thing. We tend to assume a U.S. Uh, perspective on it. And all of these things are both ands and, and other. Um, and so when we talk about the conversation about race, um, it's not a black white binary. We are really talking about everything and everyone um, because what we have is at a certain point in our history, the supremacy of whiteness became a thing. Um, everything from scientific 
and that's in air quotes, ideals that said that this race is the ideal race. Um, it, um, I wish I knew names and dates better, but basically a guy who liked to collect skulls sat around one day and said, I think these skulls from the Caucasus area of the world are the most beautiful. And that day race was created. <laughs> and it was the foundation of these ideas that eventually this, this skull collector uh, passed on these ideas as, um, being, as being science. And we got to this point somewhere down the line where laws and policies and who could vote and who could own land and all this was determined by race. And so fast forward to where we are today, um, we have the legacy of that. We have where, um, where different groups have been given access or denied access based on what their racial, racial ca category or classification is. And then when we see what's happening right now, we see all the tension and we see all, all the mess that's happening. And we're like, well, what do I do if I'm not a black person? What do I do if I'm not a white person? The reality is the supremacy of whiteness has affected all of us. If you're of Asian des descent, depending on if you're a light Asian or a dark Asian, there's stuff that you have to work on. If you're a black person, there's stuff that you've internalized that you have to work on. If you're a white person, there's stuff that you've internalized that you have to work on. Um, and so the work really is for all of us when it comes to figuring out what it is, what are the narratives or the stories that we've been handed? What are the ways of seeing the world that we've assumed are quote unquote normal? And they're really this a part of these old constructs about who is right, who is human, who is normal, who is good. And then we have to challenge that. We have to challenge it in ourselves. And then we have to challenge it in the, in the institutions and in the churches and the communities that we live in. So that's like the big arc version of it, but there's more specifics. Um, but I just wanted to kind of set that as a foundation. Um, Darren, I would have to agree with you. Uh, currently, we are living uh, in a lie in mm -hmm. America, this, this great lie that there is one race, and race, I'm saying in air quotes, is very contrived because race is not a actual construct. We're, we're part of, this is going to sound cliche, we're part of one race, and that's human race. The rest is just basically classism and um, different cultures. You, you know, and basically, for me personally, I came to a realization that maybe it is not our um, purpose to to keep telling them that um, <clears throat> that they're not superior. Uh, to stop, to stop, uh, continually to tell them that they need to lift the veil from their own eyes. They need to rescue themselves actually. And I think once they rescue themselves and realize, okay, we are all equal. I am not really, <clears throat> I'm, we're not the chosen race. I think that's when we can start moving together um, as a country. Um, Sarah or Bridget, do you have anything to um, add to that? I want to keep it more conversational. Feel free to chime in. Um, I, I wanted to just like tag on to, um, what Darren was bringing up, because I think what Darren laid was a very important foundation just in terms of recognizing that um, this is a um, journey that we all share, that we're all navigating together. Um, and then on top of that, there's also uh, the reality of anti-Blackness that exists um, and is a real Thing that needs to be grappled with um, in uh, communities of color, um, non-black communities of color. Um, and that's, that's something that has a long, long legacy um, in the United States in particular, where uh, communities of color have tried to advance themselves um, by distancing themselves as much as possible from Black people and trying to prove as much as possible that they are not Black in order to seem more white. And um, that's a problem in, you know, my own community as a Puerto Rican woman um, and something that, you know, is a, is a problem in Puerto Rico on the island where people 
are black and do have Afri African ancestry and yet for so long distanced themselves for so long from being black um, that that created so many tensions um, between Puerto Ricans um, and the black community in the United States. Um, and so uh, there's a legacy there, there's a history there um, in um, Hispanic communities, um, as well as Asian communities, as well as um, uh, you know, mixed race communities of trying to distance yourself from blackness um, as much as possible um, in order to um, be respectable, in order to be accepted. Um, and so that's also a thing that needs to be grappled with um, and um, understood and um, uh, rejected ultimately um, as we are thinking about this conversation as a conversation that we all have solidarity together with each other in that the advancement of us all is tied up together, um, recognizing um, the legacy of anti-blackness and ultimately rejecting it. <laughs> I, I um, completely um, agree with you, uh, Bridget. I think that we all should come together as, um, as a group, um, just, a, just a people of color group, because as a whole, we are the majority um, in the United States. And, and sorry if, if there's anyone on the line that is uh, in international. This is going to be kind of focused primarily uh, on the U.S. struggle, and then we'll branch out in maybe future episodes. Um, but um, as a whole, I think that uh, if we were to gather together, we'll be able to make true strides and true movements together because um, not only are black people uh, impacted by what's going on, as you stated, um, the struggle that within the other uh, people of color race, uh, races concerning um, trying to be non-black, this is also impacting the poor because the way this country was set up was to basically to keep people of color poor. And so when there's poor white people, they're, they are also feeling the struggle that some uh, people of color are um, feeling as well. So I think the poor and people of color uh, should gather together in order to make positive strides towards uh, equality. Yeah, and that that was part of that foundation, right? When when the country was when it is in its earliest ages, it was uh, the the poor white people and the poor enslaved Africans had a lot in common, and the affluent wealthy uh, white men who framed the foundation of this country were aware that if those two groups got together they could have more power. The people united will, will never be defeated, right? That they yes. have more power and would be able to disrupt the, the status quo. But instead they sold this idea that your enemy isn't the people who have the money. Your enemy is the black people. And your enemy is that they're doing this work for free, air quotes. They're doing this work and they're the reason you don't have jobs. And when you fast forward to 20, uh, was it 2018 maybe, where you saw white men in khakis and, and dockers and, and, and wearing their polo shirt, shirts with tiki torches shouting, you will not replace us. That's the same message that somehow that their livelihood is threatened by the existence and the, by the, the, the survival of other people and that they're still under this impression that what's wrong is that somebody's gonna replace them. When reality is that the economic systems we have have been replacing all of us, that the, that the, the ways that this country has been constructed has turned us all against each other rather than realizing who really gets what they want and who really has power right now. You're absolutely right. And I can actually just steer us off in a different direction and, and say that this is all a issue with the educational system because a lot of things that are happening right now are cyclical. Because if you were to look back in the past, this has all happened before. You know, all you have to do is just do a little reading. But oh, yeah. um, I will not uh, take us down that road, but that would be a good road to go down someday. Uh, <laughs> so many roads. <laughs> yes. Um, let me go ahead and ask a, a question that we just recently got from our audience from Shelby. Thank you, Shelby. 
are there any lessons learned from talking about race in uh, conservative Christian spaces? There's always, there's always so much. Um, <laughs> and I don't want to take up too much space, but uh, if I can tell a story real quick, um, this year or this year, last year, 2019, going into 2020, have been my year of reckoning in a lot of ways. I, um, I've spent at least the last 20 years of my life doing justice work, being a grassroots organizer, being a photographer and working with lots of nonprofit organizations, seeing up close and being in, in the mix with how change happens, how laws get written, how neighborhoods get transformed. And for all that work, I figured, oh, I, can, I have this really great patience to deal with people who are in very opposing positions to, to me and to the things that I fight for. But um, at a certain point, I realized I was hitting a wall. And it didn't matter how nice I was. It didn't matter how well-spoken I was. It didn't matter what facts I presented. There was a deep resistance to anything I had to say. And I couldn't understand what it was because if I was in a group of Christian leaders and I would share something that pretty much completely aligned with what they already said they believed, they would oppose it as if I was attacking them somehow. And I didn't understand what was happening um, until it just became overt. It was just like anything I did, three other people could have done the same thing, but if I said it or did it, there was gonna be all kinds of verbal attacks and my posts would get deleted, whatever. And so it's a certain point I realized um, that there's a way that uh, conservative, cons conservatism works. And it is essentially a founda foundation of fear that, um, and that's not to say all conservatives are scary, but it's more so to say fear drives the, how the world is seen and experienced. And so the fear says this person, this group, this idea is different and therefore a threat and you have to fight against it. And it doesn't matter what the idea or the person of the group is, it's everything that's not already in alignment with what they understand to be true is treated as a threat. And so what happens is for me, I had to realize that I was not going to be the one to have a lot of these conversations with people. Instead, I was gonna be the one to empower others who come from that space, who look more like them, who don't get perceived as a threat, that I, I empower those people to go and do the work that I literally cannot do. Um, but that's, you know, kind of how we all depend on each other to make the world, world better, that none of us can do all of it. That's why we're a body of Christ, you know, like everyone has a different role. Um, but a lot of times we kind of, you know, we've been, we've been taught every, each one teach one. We can all go out and, you know, like make, make the difference. Um, but the theory of change, how we make that happen, that can be hard to figure out. Um, so like, that's, that's the thing I'm working through. I'm, I'm 40 now. This is my midlife crisis. Yay. <laughs> but I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering, Sarah and Bridget, like what, what kind of, what kind of discoveries and experiences have you had like in your own spaces? I grew up in very conservative Christian environments. I think it was, wasn't until I went to college and was not in those environments and came back into them that I realized just how deeply problematic some of the spaces and some of the, the conversations and the ways that we interact with race were. Um, and I think that there's, there are so many conversations to be had about how to engage people and what to say and when to say it and all of those things. Um, but I think for me in the last few months, I have not felt convicted or called to necessarily speak up and be like that aggressive commenting on Facebook and interacting in all of these conversations. And I've felt a lot of peace as I have recognized that like it is my job to plant a seed and it is God's job to see that seed come to fruition. And so being able to take care of myself, recognize that like I live with a black brother this, like, this is a reality that I face on a daily basis that other people don't, and I cannot continue to be in these spaces doing this work all of the time. And I think there's a time and place for that. There's definitely a time and place for that. But recognizing when I am hearing the voice of God calling me into a space and when it would be better for me to rest and trust that, like, I, my voice and my words are not what is going to save someone or change someone. Absolutely right, Sarah. I, I, I completely agree with you. Um, Bridget, do you have anything more to add? Yeah, I'll just say that um, it's, uh, 
for me, when I first really started talking actively about race issues in the church um, and not even just in the church, just talking about race issues, period, um, it was very jarring for me to see how violently antagonistic people were towards that conversation. Um, and like, I had not really had a clue that it was going to be that way because I had never really tried to step on that hornet's nest so directly. Um, I grew up in a white evangelical context um, and just kind of coasted um, with the narratives that were supplied to me um, for a long, long time um, and just kind of accepted those narratives, never really challenged them in any way um, until I, um, I guess, until I graduated from college and um, then started pointing things out to people and being like, well, what about this? Well, have you considered that? Um, and it's, it's really interesting because um, there's a way of talking about race in Christian contexts that is acceptable. And I, I know this because when I graduated from college, I um, joined a, a nonprofit called Teach for America, um, and I started working in a low-income neighborhood um, that was predominantly Black and Hispanic. Um, and the way that I was expected to talk about those experiences was that the my poor students have terrible parents that are addicted to drugs and are reversed racist against white people and all they really need is jesus to save them from all of their problems and then everything is going to get better and that was the narrative um and I was very aware that that is what people expected me to talk about um, in my context. Like, oh my gosh, like how miserable all of my students are because of how bad like their parents are because of their poor choices and their sinful lifestyle. It is just like, this is the narrative that was expected. Um, and so when I started talking about the systemic issues that were causing educational inequity in these contexts, um, like you would have thought that like I had gone off the deep end and like, you know, converted to Satanism or something, um, because like just people got so angry. Um, I was just, I was very, very startled with the anger. And I wasn't even really saying anything all that radical. I was just suggesting that like, maybe there were real problems in our systems that needed to be addressed. And like, that was like, whoa, uh-uh, no, 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 no. Um, and so it's just, it's, it's interesting because like the race conversation can be had in the church as long as you have it in a certain way. And the minute you talk about it in a different way, that's when everything just like, forget it, like it's over. <laughs> you are right about that. I, you know, I was thinking the other side of one is, you know, you can't talk about systemic injustice, right? But then there's this other side that is, let's talk about reconciliation. <laughs> Is that a trigger word for anybody else? <laughs> so like, true, so true. <laughs> oh gosh, uh, that the the reconciliation thing where let's not talk about any history. Let's not talk about anything systemic. Let's just hurry up and get to the part where we all love each other, and we can hurry up and 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 just get more people to be reconciled to God through Jesus. And, and it's just like, yeah, but. They, <laughs> you're absolutely right. It's like, they don't want to talk about the hard work. They just want to talk about 
um, glory. And they forget that Christ had to literally get scourged and die. So there is a, um, you know, for us, so there is a process to get to glory. And we still have to go through that process. We, we're still in the, in the birth pains of this country. We're still a very young country compared to all the other countries of the world. And, uh, and, we're, and we're dealing with, uh, with this, this issue that is very frustrating to me because it's not logical. Um, but um, let me piggyback on what on our current conversation with a uh, question. Um, do you believe that the issues of racism in the state uh, is different than um, other countries? Um, do you believe it is equally a worldwide issue, racism? Well, let me start first. Um, yeah. Uh, Racism is a worldwide issue. It varies from country to country. The people group that uh, is being um, persecuted um, is, will vary from um, country to country. Um, specifically, to drill back into the, um, the U.S., what makes the racism here um, unique than other countries is, uh, is the history of slavery and um, how we recorded that history, how, how the, our textbooks lie about the history, and the type of slavery we have, which is different than other countries, was chattel uh, slavery. And when you think of chattel slavery, that's with a CH, just think of human cattle. And um, the humanity of Africans were uh, taken from them in order for them to have a conscience to write their constitution that says that all men are created equal. That did not include all the other people of color. Um, and um, the founding fathers made themselves believe that Africans weren't you, you, human at all. And um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much the difference uh, between um, racism here and racism ar uh, around the world. And around the world, I've found that there's a lot of colorism issues. Um, and I'll let uh, some other people in the panel talk about colorism if you have a, a passion about it. Does anyone like to talk about I'll go it? ahead. Yeah, I'll go ahead and take a stab and other people can uh, jump in. Yeah, I 100% agree with you that there's lots and lots of issues um, related to colorism worldwide, including in the United States. Um, and in some ways, like I, I get annoyed by other countries who try to like pretend that racism is not, is just a US problem because it's not. Um, it is a very serious problem everywhere in the world. Um, it's not just a US issue, but like sometimes people, like they want to like be like, oh, that's like the Americans. Um, and like, you know, like, I don't know, sometimes I talk to people from Australia and it's like they have like no concept that they literally committed genocide against the indigenous people there. And it's like, Ah! Um, so <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah but getting back to getting back to colorism um i think like that is a uh, topic that is going to become more and more important to be having um in the united states um especially as more mixing take takes place and things like that um, it's an especially important conversation in Latin America um, in particular, um, where you can kind of see colorism happening like right in front of you, where like the like colors just kind of tend to get lighter the higher up in the totem pole of power you go. And there's like, there's no way specifically to say like, these are the white people and these are the black people and these are the indigenous people like there there is in many countries but like in so many countries it's so blended that like there's no distinctions between this and yet you look at the skin tone and like you can clearly see like the whitest of the white people are at the top and the darkest of the dark people are like in poverty um and that's a that's a really hard conversation to have, especially amongst people of color, because there can be like this feeling of like, you know, like, you know, well, you know, I'm I'm black and, you know, I'm not any less black than you are. Like, you know, I'm like <laughs> I'm I'm Latina and like you're Latina. We're the same. But like, yes, like, yes, 
sense, okay? Like we can relate to each other in those ways, but at the same time, skin color matters. How light or how dark your skin is matters um, and affects the way people perceive you. Um, and um, it's important to embrace that conversation as a part and parcel of um, addressing racial inequity. Um, because if we don't, we'll find ourselves um, facing a new form of colorblindness um, in, in the United States. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the, oh gosh, you like said so many important things. Um, colorblindness as, again, that, that way that we, in our Christianese kind of thing where we like to just paint over everything with the, with the love of Jesus or the blood of Jesus, depending on what your theology is. Um, <laughs> and forget that we're, forget that we're, we're gay or straight and forget that we're there. We're black and white. We're just going to all be Christians. And the, 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 the hunger for that doesn't come from, uh, I don't think it comes from an authentic place of unity. We say we want to just be unified, right? We say we want to we want to fix everything. We want to move past this so we can go on to more important things. But I think there's a there's a way that we just like to be declared innocent in ways that haven't really been earned. Um, there's a way that uh, as people in the U.S., we're taught that we're the heroes of the world. Where as soon as you leave this country, we know that story is not so true. Um, there's a way that we are kind of just conditioned to um, make ourselves the protagonists in all the stories. And so we, uh, especially if you've been raised in a, in a, in a culture that's informed by Western um, values, like there's this rush to not really understand the issue, but rather to hurry up and solve it. And for me, that's the thing I want us to like really deal with that. None of this is going to have quick answers or quick quick resolution and if that's true how do we work on these issues in a way that is sustainable for the rest of our lives knowing that they don't get solved anytime before you know before we we either get called back or before Jesus returns <laughs> that, that is so beautifully put there and I just I loved how how you phrased that and I think the first step is exposing the lie and addressing the lie and and the lie is is that one race is superior than the other and um as soon as we can get over that lie lie then we can actually progress forward and i think that that is the um the the only way and i'm going to go a little bit um of a tangent about the lie because that's something that i've been struggling with right now because you know I believed a lie. I, I believed that if I talked a certain way, if I looked a certain way, if I wore my hair a certain way, if I got a high enough education, uh, if I um, got a high enough grade point average, they Talk won't about look all at of me it. like I was different. They won't look at me like I'm a savage. They'll treat me equally, and it was a lie. And I'm twisting my fist right now because. <sighs> I've had a I've had an officer pull a gun on me before at a traffic stop. I was driving a Toyota Tacoma wearing a skirted business suit with a laptop briefcase and they pulled a gun on me like I was a criminal because they said I made a right without using my blinker. <laughs> and right, like that was the threat to society that you needed a gun pulled on you. Yeah. Exactly. And I'm just like, that's when it finally hit me. Now, this happened uh, several years ago. That's when it finally hit me. You don't see me. You don't see how hard I've worked. You don't see how I speak, my cadence, anything. You don't see me at all. You're threatened by my blackness. And my blackness is beautiful. You shouldn't be threatened by it. You know? So um, that's, that's my current struggle. Um, right now with what's going on is with it's with the lie that's being um, forced to us uh, force fed to us rather um, let's go ahead and move on to another question um, Sarah oh, I think was going to say something oh sorry Sarah go ahead no you found your point um 
I definitely relate to that experience. I, my dad is African, my dad's from Ghana. And so I think grew up very much with that like immigrant lie that like, if we are good enough, then we will, then they will love us. And then we can be like them and kind of not engaging the black side of me and kind of watering that down to adhere to this idea of whiteness. And I think it was, I watched a movie about a shooting that happened. And in that moment, you see that the officer saw that the man was black and he shot him. He didn't talk to him. He didn't ask him if he was educated and just the, I think it, it, it really hit me that regardless of how educated I am, how, how well I present in all of this, um, that is, it doesn't impact how the world is going to see me and it does, it's not going to impact how, what my future is going to look like and I have to fight against this lie regardless of how I was raised, regardless of, and that like, we will see reconciliation when we begin to unify and when I identify with my black siblings, not when I distance myself from them. Another thought on something that Darren said earlier about painting the blood of Jesus over everything for reconciliation. I watched a panel recently that talked about, um, they were talking about this, this a very similar conversation and that white people can't unify something that they don't even know. And so if you are not aware of your culture, if you're not aware of the impact of your culture, we can't come to the table and have this conversation about reconciliation because you don't even know what we are unifying. And I really loved that idea. Yeah. And this, this, this whole process of realizing what our own experiences are, right? Where, where Sarah realizes that as an immigrant, there are certain things told to her, where, where Meredith realizes that there were certain ideals that were presented as this is the way to be the right kind of Black person who is above racism. Like, we're, we're all being told certain things. White people are being told certain things about what it means to be white where they had to stop being Irish and they had to stop being Italian. They had to stop being all the other things that they were before they, they uh, 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 were assumed or assimilated into whiteness. And so we all lose something. But I think there's a really important intersection that kind of hits on one of the questions that, uh, that Shelby was asking in the comments of how does this interact with LGBTQ spaces that are um, often dominated by cis, uh, cis white gay men? And for me, I often see that um, white men who grew up in the US don't realize what it means to be excluded until they realize that they're gay or until they're presumed to be gay. And it is at that point that they like have this point of, of compassion and, 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 and investment in what it means to be oppressed and what it, and how the narratives of if you just do X, Y, Z, if you just work hard, if you just be the right person, where all that falls apart for the first time. And then they kind of like get sometimes a little bit too uh, presumptive that they understand. And it's just like, oh, now I'm now, now I know oppression. <laughs> It's like, boo, this is the, this is the iceberg. This is the tip. <laughs> Thanks so much for bringing that up, Darren. Please talk more about um, cis white gay men and them being oppressed. And I'm using that in air quotes. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll give a little bit because as, as, a, as a cis man, I often have had to have my own awakenings. Um, I'm also a tall man. I'm six foot two. Um, Fortunately, I was raised with a mom who uh, was a feminist before I knew what feminism was, and she would help me to see the differences in how we'd be treated. For example, when I was a kid, I was like 12 years old. I could go into a computer store, an electronic store, say, I need this, this, that, I want blah, 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 and so forth. And without question, I was going to get exactly what I wanted from whoever was working at the store. If I sent my mom with the exact same words to do the exact same thing, even though she was an adult, well, why do you need that? Are you sure that's what you need? Well, maybe you should get this instead. All of a sudden, all of her, all of the things that she said weren't really accepted as true. And I knew about that and I was aware of it. But then later on in, in life, I, I was talking to a friend and she's, she's graduated with degrees and she's an engineer and, and she works uh, with these in, these, in, in engineering, there's not a, an abundance of women, especially not black women. And when she would speak up, her subordinates in the company would ask her, well, where'd you go to school? And, and, and what are you, you know, how, are you sure that you've got this right? And, and so forth. She's got all the degrees. She's done all the things. 
but because of the way we have, have made assumptions about women and the way we've made assumptions um, about anybody who's not at the top of the pyramid, um, I had to learn that no one ever asked me where I went to school. <laughs> no one ever asked me to, to, to verify what I'm talking about, unless it's a cisgender white man <laughs> who somehow, somehow is like, well, what do you know about this? It's like, I've, I've got some experience here. But um, I, I'd love to hear from, from uh, female identified folks, like what kind of experiences have been really like standing out to you, especially when it comes to LGBTQ space, because men are the face of the LGBTQ community somehow. <laughs> So I will, I'll add a few, a few thoughts to this. Um, first of all, I do think that there are plenty of cis white gay men that do get it, that do lean into all the various other intersections of this conversation. Um, having said that, as we've all identified, um, it's hard not to notice um, just the glaring reality that LGBTQ spaces are so dominated by cis white gay men. Um, and uh, it surprised me at first, but now it no longer does. Um, some of the most vocally racist people that I have encountered have been cis white gay men. Um, and there's a reason for that. And the reason is that when you only have one singular experience of oppression, it's so much more easier to desire to gain acceptance um, and gain admission into the majority group by catering to them and their desires and, and basically uh, playing to respectability politics. Um, and so what winds up happening is there's this pressure that builds to try to um, perform in other ways to gain acceptance into spaces of power um, and spaces of power are predominantly white, cisgender, male spaces. Um, and so there's that, that plays to um, all sorts of issues related to sexism and racism um, and transphobia that all come together um, to um, kind of encourage cis white gay men to um, just kind of not really show up for any of those communities and instead cater to gaining admission to this place of power that they just need to convince not to be homophobic. Um, and if they can just convince them, then they can gain admission and they don't have to worry about everybody else and they can just leave them behind. Um, and one thing that, you know, has always been interesting to me is that, um, when I started writing, and I've been writing for um, like about a decade now, most of my writing was geared towards issues of racial justice in the education system and specifically um, educating Christians on those issues. And the resistance that I received from people was like near universal and absolute. Um, I could not get a word in edgewise. Anything that I said was discounted, not believed. I was a race baiter, yada, yada. Um, it was not until I started writing about sexuality that my blog started gaining more traction. And the reason is obvious to me, but maybe not always obvious to other people. The reason is because issues touching upon sexuality impact white people and white people have more clout, um, more power, um, more access um, to spaces of influence. Um, and so suddenly my blog appealed to white people and suddenly the things that I wrote started getting shared. Um, and that's not something that um, I was blind to in any way. It was very obvious to me why. 
um, because my blog, it was only white people that were reading my blog. It was only white people. Uh, I had grown up in white evangelical spaces. I had gone to a majority white school. Um, and it was not until I started bringing in the sexuality conversation that suddenly people wanted to talk. Um, and so that's a really important thing to recognize is that um, whiteness itself is a form of power in the, in the sexuality conversation. Um, and to the extent that that's not looked at, not acknowledged, not wrestled with, um, it's very difficult to understand and have a full picture of how all of these things kind of come together. <laughs> wow, that's, that's powerful. That's actually, it's causing me to go inside and, and, and think more um, in regards to um, how the only way that your blog gained traction is because it started to impact white people. Yeah. And that is, um, I'm happy that it gained traction, but I'm also sad. I feel, um, I feel, I, I feel mixed emotions right now um, about that. And um, I think the struggle should, should cause people to want to, to read and to gather together and not just say, oh, okay, it's impacting this people group. So let's, you know, let's go ahead and watch and let's bring attention to it. So, yeah. oh, wow. <clears throat> I'm hoping, I'm hope, I'd love that you named the emotions in that, Meredith, that I'm hoping that we do get to the place of collective lament, that we get to the place where we can um, mourn and grieve and, and just face the loss and face how many opportunities and conversations and lives have been lost to the to the ways that our society is a stru is structured. Um, again, when we're in that rush to hurry up and fix it, there's no time to feel sad. There's no time to do that. Or we do the thing where we only feel sad for for our own um, for our own mistakes, where where we're just worried about oh I I don't want to get things wrong or anything. Um, I think that's I think that's part of that that really difficult intersection of Christianity with all of these varying um, marginalized identities, uh, Christianity does teach us that we do do wrong and we do and we need to repent. Um, but when we when we're repenting from a place of power, I think we we kind of miss the impact sometimes. Um, and I'm thinking kind of real time, but I'm just thinking about how there's a difference in repentance as like liberation versus repentance as in, I don't want to lose my place or I don't want to lose what I have. Um, there's people who, when they get called out about racism, they're worried about what they're going to lose. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my reputation, but it's not, I'm going to lose, you know, it's, it's not the same as, oh, I've really harmed someone. It's not coming from that place of, wow, I really did something that's, or participated in a system that's been horribly oppressive. And I, I think that's part of just what's been missing. Um, people really understanding the weight of what's happened and kind of grieving that. Sarah, did you want to add something? Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that idea of repentance. I think it's something that I've really come to appreciate about um, particularly black spaces that we have this like legacy of struggle, but hope rooted in that. And that it's this hope that's rooted in this, the, the knowledge that this world is not, does not value my body, does not see me as worthy and all of these things, but also the, the looking to that because I know that this world is not going to value my body and is not going to look at me in the, the ways that God does, I have to be rooted in this God who says all of these things about me and who affirms my identity and all of that. And that we can, it's not this like easy, fun reconciliation that erases everything, but that is rooted in this idea that like, no, yes, there is so much to struggle for, but also there is so much hope and we've seen so much liberation and like I can lament, but also recognize that God is present in my lament as I, and sad about these structures and the, the brokenness that exists in the world. Beautifully Absolutely. stated. Yeah. Beautifully stated.
Well, everyone, I hope you are learning as much from this recording as I learned as I sat there listening to it live. They all share just so many, so many good things. This is the end of part one, but guess what? There is another episode already published, just waiting with just as much good content. So go on over and click and play the next episode. It is totally worth it. There's just so much more good stuff to come from Darren and Meredith and Sarah and Bridget. Again, I want to say thank you so much to the four of them for doing this. And as well, thank you to everyone who was there participating in the conversation as well. Your questions and your comments, the conversation would not have been the same without you. Thank you guys. And see you over in the next episode.